coming out of the Big 12, you don't have to be complete glass eaters in order to ultimately possibly win the league, get within striking distance of winning the league, and ultimately, hey, you go 11-1, to guess what? You're in the college football playoff conversation. Hello and welcome to Always College Football. I'm your host, Greg McElroy. With me, as always, Jack Foster. Mark Kubiak's out on vacation. He hates the show and he clearly hates college football. We also have a new intern, Peyton's with us as well, so we appreciate her coming in. Unfortunately, uh, everyone that works at Always College Football is basically diehard Tennessee. Peyton is as well, so... Uh, you know, we just agree to disagree sometimes in, in our show meetings and, and pre and post show conversation. But either way, happy that she's here and happy that we have Jack steering the ship here. In the meantime, Jake Garcia is here with us as well. Look, we have a great show today. We're going to have some fun. All right. We're, we're going to do watch list, right? We got, we got what, nine, 10 days from getting to the media day hype train. Okay. So why don't we just get out in front of it and just create some hype? in our in our own show you know, i think that's what we should do today so we did basically put together a bunch of watch lists we came came up with a bunch of different superlative categories and we put together some people that will occupy some of those superlatives some are big with six or seven candidates some are really small with just two candidates but either way we are going to have a midsummer edition of superlatives now take it with a grain of salt these are not our hold me to them superlatives they're not well, we're going to get to those in August because there's still a lot to be figured out. There might be an injury in the preseason. Maybe there's a late transfer. Maybe a guy decides not to play. Who knows? Maybe there's an early enrollee that reclassifies and decides to jump in. Like, who knows? So these are not hold me to them predictions just yet. These are just for some summer fun and for some summer fodder. But we will get to those here at a later date. So let's not waste any additional time. Let's get to it. Some summer superlative watch list right here on Always College Football. As I've prefaced already, this is going to be the watch list show, if you will. So we're not necessarily going with the hold me to them, etch it and sewn, tell you exactly how things are going to look this upcoming season. This is kind of the watch list. And as we look over some of the superlatives, which there are many that we're going to get through, we want you to know that these are some of the teams we're keeping an eye on for some of the things that we're going to rank down the road. Now, when we get into August and we have gone through fall camp, the quarterback derbies that are playing themselves out, we start to get some clarity with who's going to be where, how it's all going to sort itself out. Then we'll go with the hold me to them predictions. But just for today here in the middle of July, why would we not just tell you, hey, here's the preseason watch list for some of the most topic friendly fodder that we're going to have over the next six weeks that sound good for y'all because it sounds good for us we'll have some fun with it and i'm sure there'll be people that are reaching out in the comments that are saying hey no 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 no! we forgot this guy i understand this is designed to leave people out (laughs) and to make adjustments here as we move a little bit forward remember there were quarterbacks for instance drake may for instance that at this point last year was deep in a quarterback battle and we all know how it went for drake may right it ended up going pretty good and he of course became a top 10 heisman vote getter i don't remember what he was seven whatever it was it was really good really high and yet at this point last year we didn't even know if he was going to be the guy So let's stop wasting some time. Let's get to it, okay? Let's start with the team that is most likely to surprise us with a huge year. Now let's preface this. Surprise us. A team that might be lying in the weeds. A team that's not getting a lot of conversation. Some people might refer to these teams as, quote, sleepers. I don't know if these two teams are necessarily going to creep up on anybody, but hey, these are two that have kind of stood out to me. Now, most of these lists will have four, maybe five, six entries on it. This one felt a little bit more concise. And as we continue to evaluate quarterback competitions and other spots, maybe we'll adjust accordingly. But as of right now, I have two teams on the teams poised and coiled to break out. Team number one, the Ole Miss Rebels. Now, a lot of people are going to sit there and say, hang on a second. Wait, how did things go down the stretch last year? It, not, not, not so good. We, we understand that. Eight and one, though, however, in their first nine games. Lost what was a somewhat very, actually, in some ways, competitive game against Alabama. A game that was, you know, a little bit dicey there for the Tide at one point or another. 
And then you fast forward a little bit and they lose their final four games and they finish the season eight and five and the defensive performance against Arkansas left an awful lot to be desired. But we all know that Lane Kiffin's done a really good job in the portal, not just at the quarterback spot, but at other positions as well. I think they have difference makers potentially at tight end, not just one, but two. I think they have difference makers at wide receiver. And I also think, too, they might have the nation's best running back in Quinshawn Judkins. He's certainly in the mix. If he's not at the top, he's certainly in the top two or three. Well, let's talk a little bit, though, about what's plagued them. It's the defensive side of the football, and they now brought in Pete Golding from Alabama, going to alter the structure, going to alter the way they line up down to down. They're not going to be so, you know, soft and giving up underneath stuff and play dink and dunk, bend, don't break. No, this is going to be a group that attacks. And when you look at some of the pieces that they've added on the defensive side, I think the front seven is a chance to be in the top end of the SEC. I'm not saying the top. I'm saying in the top end, meaning the top half. I think that group has a chance to be significantly improved. Now, part of the problem for Ole Miss is their depth. Will they have enough depth? That's the big question. However, they are certainly on the short list of sleeper teams. Look, everyone's going to talk Bama. Everyone's going to talk LSU. Everyone's going to talk Texas A&M. Don't sleep on the Rebels. Just telling you, do not sleep on the Rebels heading in to this year. We were right about TCU last year, by the way. I'm not going to you know, pat ourselves on the back, but we were all over the TCU breakthrough. Now, do we see them coming up short in the national championship game? Uh, do we expect them to go that far? No, but we thought 10 wins was certainly gettable. We thought the possibility of maybe winning nine would have been a significant overachievement, given the fact that Vegas had them at seven. So we, we were right about TCU. I think we have a chance to be right about Ole Miss, too. Not enough people talking about the personnel they have, and we'll talk about their quarterback situation here in a superlative down the road. Let's talk about the other team that I think has a chance to make some make some serious noise. That'd be the Wisconsin Badgers. And... A lot of people are going to say, hang on, there's a pretty significant shift in philosophy. Well, I, I acknowledge that without question. And it's tough, I think, when you think about what they were to what they're going to be. We're talking about a down, down, and around, ground and pound style of attack. Three yards in a cloud of dust. But they have gotten a little bit more multiple in the last couple of years. Now, ultimately, they haven't quite shifted to the air raid. They're not Mississippi State or Texas Tech back in the day. But with Phil Longo coming in as the O.C., this is going to be a completely different looking group. And if you talk to people that are familiar with the personnel on the roster, they're very excited about the wide receivers that they have. I've long been very high on Tanner Mordecai. I think Tanner Mordecai has got a chance in this offense with more reps. I know it didn't look good in the spring game, but with more reps, I think he's got a chance to be a top end quarterback of the Big Ten. Where does he go into rank? I don't entirely know, but he's an experienced guy that understands how to run the system and I think will run the system at a remarkably high level. Now, defensively, they're always going to be strong. They're always going to be stout. They're always going to be proud. And, you know, Luke Fickle is going to design practice to make sure they don't lose any of their physicality, but they're going to try to be more explosive offensively in an effort to balance out their attack. So those are the two teams that I think are poised right now to be sleepers. I'm not saying they make the playoff. I'm not saying they win the national championship. I'm not saying you need to go bet the house on them to, you know, be in the, be in the playoff or the conference championship game, what have you. All I'm saying, those are two teams that nobody's talking about. And yet I think people should be. Okay, let's move on to the next superlative. How about teams that are going to make the college football playoff for the first time? This one, a little bit more difficult because I had forgotten that both Washington and Florida State had made the playoff before. It's been that long. Washington made it back in 2016. Florida State, of course, made it in 2014. And honestly, it's felt like a really different world since those two teams were last in the postseason. They, however, are not included in this discussion. The two teams that I went with to make the playoff for the first time, the Texas Longhorns. Now, a lot of people are going to say every year, every year we do this. Why, why do we continue to force Texas at everybody in the preseason? And while I, believe me, as a media member, do fall victim to the occasional Texas fatigue, they're pretty good, y'all. They're pretty good. And I think when you look at their roster, assuming significant growth at the quarterback spot, assuming the wide receiver group can stay healthy, which they couldn't do last year, assuming their tight end becomes a major difference maker, assuming 
given the fact that it's the Texas Longhorns, assuming they have a pretty dang good running back. I'm not saying these B. John Robinson. I'm not even going to so, go as far as to say that they're going to be Roshan Johnson at running back. But I would imagine, based on the group of guys that are competing, competing for carries, they will be adequate at that spot. Defensively, Pete Kwiatkowski, as the defensive coordinator, runs a really good system. And if you look, if you look at their defensive personnel along the line of scrimmage, they are not the Georgia Bulldogs. They're not the Ohio State Buckeyes of yesteryear. They're not the Michigan Wolverines, but they are pretty good and they have grown in that area. And remember, who won the Big 12 last year and ultimately punched their ticket? Or who was the best team in the Big 12 last year and ultimately punched their ticket to the college football playoff? It was TCU. Did TCU, answer me this, did TCU have game-changing defensive difference makers? I'm just I'm asking I'm asking the question because I, I've I've watched TCU's defense from last year. I thought they were very athletic. Uh, I thought they did a really good job of playing all the way through the whistle. Uh, I thought they occasionally made some really big plays by forcing bad decisions by the opposing quarterback. But top to bottom, you look at that group. Yes, they were pretty good at corner. No denying that they were very good at corner. But outside of that, the internal nine. It's not like they had seven all Americans between their safeties, linebackers, and defensive front. They had really good players, very solid players. But it's not like they were complete game changers. And coming out of the Big 12, you don't have to be complete glass eaters in order to ultimately possibly win the league, get within striking distance of winning the league, and ultimately, hey, you go 11-1, to 1, guess what? You're in the college football playoff conversation. So I think Texas has the recipe. Now, will they ultimately do it? That's what we need to find out here in the coming years. The next one is not going to be as difficult to sell you on. The USC Trojans, they were within a game of getting in last year. But first year, Lincoln Riley, they didn't have the depth. And I don't think at this point, they necessarily had the personnel on the defensive front to be able to ultimately get over that hump. And you look at the offensive line, while they played great in the first 10, 11 games of the season. They didn't do what they needed to do against Utah in order to ultimately punch their ticket to the college football playoff. But I think another year in the system, another year getting comfortable, another year figuring out how Lincoln Riley is going to do things and assuming even more growth at the quarterback spot, which is almost impossible to predict. But would you bet against Caleb Williams at this point? Because I will not. I think he's going to be even better in 2023 than he was in 2022. But I also think you look at the other weapons that he has at his disposal. There are some pieces to replace. No denying that. But if they can improve just a little bit on the defensive side, they could definitely emerge from what should be a loaded Pac-12 field. Those are the two I'm going with the most likely to make the college football playoff for the first time. I wanted badly to include Utah. I wanted to. I just couldn't do it. Oregon's already been in. The Pac-12 feels to me like it's poised for someone to break through. It really does. And I'm not sure exactly who that team's going to be, whether it's SC, Oregon, Utah. Uh, you know, God, goodness gracious, UCLA still has some really good pieces. Oregon State, if they can improve at quarterback and balance out that rushing attack, maybe they're dangerous. So I think the Pac-12 is wide open and is arguably the most compelling league in college football as far as how many teams can actually win it here in 2023. So I think you pick any of those teams that hadn't made the playoff before, you can make a very, very strong argument on their behalf here this year. One team that's notably missing, I'll get to them here in just a minute. Most likely to have a strong start and then ultimately fade as the season goes along. Now, this was very difficult for me because I like both these teams an awful lot, but I do wonder a little bit just where they're at in regards to depth. I do think that Oklahoma is a team to keep an eye on when looking at this superlative. Now, I think Brett Venables is doing all the right things. I really believe that. They attacked the portal. I think they're going to be a more physical team this year. I think they're going to be a more physically mature team this year. But is the roster where it needs to be to be able to compete week in and week out at a consistently high level? I hope it is. I genuinely hope it is. And I was very proud of the growth that they showed from their lowest point against the Texas Longhorns to how they performed against Florida State in the bowl game. They grew, then they got better, 
And I do think that in time, that growth will continue. But I'm not sure the depth is there just yet. And I think this year's version of the Big 12 is really deep. And I think there's a lot of teams that can beat each other up. I really believe that. So let's go through the schedule. Arkansas State, that'll be a win. SMU at home, that should be a win as well. SMU breaking a new quarterback. But SMU is going to put some points on the board. They're going to test that defense. So we'll get a good indicator of how far that defense has come in year number two under Brent Venables. I think they'll get that one. At Tulsa, should be one they get. At Cincinnati, Cincinnati in a little bit of a, not saying a rebuild, Scott Satterfield steps into what is a pretty good situation, but I think there could be a little bit of turbulence in Cincinnati's season, so I expect Oklahoma to potentially get that one. And Cincinnati, I do think, has a chance to be in the top 25 at that point. Iowa State at home, that should be a win. You're going to get a uh, Red River game against Texas that should be excellent. Maybe you come up short. Maybe you pull it off. We've seen crazier things happen in that game. Texas is the class of the Big 12. How many times has an average Texas team beat a really good Oklahoma team or at least given them fits? We've seen it plenty of times, and I think that game can always be a little bit of a coin toss. UCF, another game that can definitely be won there at Oklahoma, but here's where I think it gets really dicey. Now you're going to say at Kansas, okay, well, you just ran a gauntlet. At Kansas is tough. It's the last Bedlam game. You got that one on the road in Stillwater. That's going to be tough. You get BYU on the road, second to last game of the season. You get TCU, a team that's probably, I think, I'll get to them in a minute, the team that might not be up to stuff to where they were last year, but they might be fighting for an eight win and they want to try to pull something off against Oklahoma at their place. So I look at Oklahoma's schedule and I think it's definitely a very manageable schedule. I believe that. But is there depth where they need to be to get back to within striking distance of the Big 12 championship game? I'm not sure of that. I think they'll drop a few that they shouldn't. And as a result, there'll be a team that's probably sitting in the top 10 through four or five weeks, but ultimately might be lucky to finish in the top 25, top 20 at the very best. So I think the team that starts fast, Oklahoma, might not finish quite as strong when the game goes along. But give it time, Oklahoma fans. I have faith. I have belief. Let's get to the other team I think has a chance to potentially have a very difficult second half of the season. Now, you're going to say I'm crazy with this, but that's okay. That's where we can agree to disagree. Penn State is a team I have major question marks about. Now, not about whether or not they have talent, not about whether or not the youth from last year will continue to grow and progress, not about some of the areas, but I look at some of the pieces they lost defensively. They lost an excellent safety. They lost an excellent corner. They lost some good personnel along the line of scrimmage. Yes, I know they have an excellent second-year linebacker that might be all world. We'll find that out. I think the running backs are excellent, but I have question marks about Drew Aller. Everyone's really high on him. I have question marks. I don't know yet. I think he's going to be good. I can't tell you that without a shadow of a doubt, but everyone hyping him as if he's the next great one for Penn State. I'm not willing to go down that rabbit hole just yet. We'll see. Give it a couple of weeks. We're going to find out. West Virginia, a game that I would expect them to win. It's at home. You should handle West Virginia. I do think West Virginia's got a chance to be sneaky good, but at the same time, West Virginia... I'm not sure their roster at this point is going to be as competitive as Penn State is. So that's a game I would expect them to win. Delaware, that should be a win. At Illinois, very difficult game. I think Illinois has got a chance if they can figure out who to, who's going to replace their excellent tailback from a year ago. And they obviously, I think Luke Altmyer has got a chance to be pretty good. But Illinois is going to be strong on defense. They're going to be physical, but they do have to replace some stars off last year's roster. Iowa at home. That should be, I think, a really competitive game, but a game that ultimately Penn State will win. So what are we right now? 4-0, 3-1. and They get, a, they get a win at Northwestern. You get UMass at home. Now we're cooking with gas. You're looking at 5-1, and 6-0 and potentially, probably sitting in the top five. Then you go on the road to Ohio State. I think that's going to be a difficult game for them to win. Indiana at home. Maybe you have a little bit of a letdown, a little bit of a hangover. I can't imagine them losing to Indiana. But... Either way, I think that game could be a little bit more difficult. A game at Maryland, very difficult game. I think Maryland's going to be really good this year. I'm a believer in them. I think Talia and company, if they can replace the personnel at wide receiver, they're going to be extremely dangerous in the Big Ten. Then you get Michigan at home. Now we're looking at a position where you go to Ohio State, to Maryland, and get Michigan at home. 
Those are three games that I think are extremely losable for Penn State. Couple that with now Rutgers at home, game that you should win. Then you have the neutral side against Michigan State. Maybe Michigan State needs it to get the bowl eligible. Who knows? But you could see a team very easily go from six and zero, five and one, to six and four, five and five in a very short period of time, seven and four or whatever it is. You, you get what I'm at. That four game stretch is extremely difficult. If they can handle Indiana, the other three are certainly not gimmies. Maybe they steal one. It's a great opportunity for Penn State either way, but I would be highly surprised if they're not ranked in the top five going into that game against Ohio State. Let's go next to the team that is most likely to disappoint in 2020. Three. Now, I don't like talking about this. I'm just going to be honest. I don't like it uh, because I don't like to feel as though, hey, man, this team's going to slip up. Like, I want, y'all know me. Like, when it comes to this sport, like, I root for everybody. It's kind of sickening. I get that. You probably roll your eyes at how positive I am or how I'm going to find the silver lining or I'm going to find the glass half full. We're, most of the time, yeah, we're going to try. But I'm going to be honest with you. I think TCU comes back to earth. Uh, not because of what we witnessed in the national championship game. That does not impact my evaluation of where the Horned Frogs are. But I looked back at just how many close calls and how many balls bounced their way in 2022. I have a very difficult time thinking that they're going to continue to bounce their way here in 23. I believe in Chandler Morris, their new starting quarterback. I think he's got tons of ability. I think he's got tons of potential, but I also think he has tons of injury concerns based on what's happened in previous years. He has had a difficult time staying healthy. He's not a very big guy and he does take chances with his body. He's got to be smart. He cannot get hurt. If he does, then their season could slip away very quickly. I also like some of the transfer portal additions. You look at Avion Carter. You look at Mason White. You look at JoJo Earl. Uh, you look at Avery Helm. You look at some of the other guys that have entered in the portal. They have some guys that can plug and play right now. But I also think there are a few guys on that list that maybe their expectations for them coming in and changing a position battle aren't necessarily going to materialize. So I think Sonny Dykes' team caught lightning in the bottle last year. They were one of the most exciting, one of the best stories we've ever covered in the sport. But I think it's coming back to earth here in 23. It's difficult to sustain that level of success, especially when you had to win so many close games. And now, guess what? You're circled on every single team's schedule going into this upcoming season. I think they come back to earth just a little bit. Let's go into the first year head coaches that are likely to succeed. I've already referenced what I feel with Wisconsin this year. I think Luke Fickle steps into a good situation, a place with good culture, a place that's going and has won a lot of football games in the last decade, 15 years, 20 years. He's not going to need to change people's behavior. They're going to work hard. They know how to practice. They know how to prepare. Now it's about energizing one side of the football and not allowing the other side of the football to dwindle. I think he's got a chance to have immediate success. I also love Matt Rule's situation at Nebraska. Now, I liked Nebraska going into last year. Uh, I did not see it going sideways the way it did. I thought they'd be far more competitive. It did not materialize. Either way, I think Matt Rule has already won over the faithful. I think his quarterback, more on him in a minute, has a chance to be a significant difference maker. And I also think that that's the type of guy that you just would never bet against. Matt Rule is a star and would expect him to do impressive things. I know, look, when he got to Baylor, it was a dumpster fire and it took some time. But they got there. You look at Nebraska, it wasn't a dumpster fire. Two years ago, they were actually highly competitive. They didn't win enough games, but they were highly competitive and played hard. And maybe Matt Rule is the missing link to get them over the top. I certainly hope they are. It'd be great to have Nebraska back in the national conversation. I think Hugh Freeze is in a really good spot as well. Now, I think the roster has some work to do. They're not where they need to be. They're not where they want to be. But based on where they were last year, I think there are some significant improvements, significant improvements that have been made, largely due to what Hugh Freeze has done on the recruiting trail. He's done a good job in the portal. And he's gone out and he's addressed certain position issues, brought in Peyton Thorne from Michigan State. That's an experienced guy that can help settle everybody down in that offensive huddle. So I think that Hugh Freeze is the right guy at the right time for Auburn. 
feel already. They've already sold out all their season tickets. You know, Jordan Hare is going to be rocking. It's going to be a difficult place to go play. So if he can pull off a big upset in year number one, then he'll already be ahead of schedule with where he's at on the planes. And then finally, how can we not talk about Deion Sanders? Uh, I think Deion Sanders enters into a good situation. Now you're going to say, how could you possibly say that? They went 1-11 last year. Yeah, but the expectations are nothing for Colorado. Like, yes, we're talking about them. But if Colorado goes 4-8 and eight this year, is anyone going to be shocked? If Colorado goes 7-5 and five this year, people are going to act like Deion Sanders is the greatest coach in the history of the world. He is playing with house money. And it's a terrific situation to be in. He's already improved the roster drastically. Well, I watched the spring game like you did. There were not a lot of Division I high-level caliber football players on that field. There just weren't. You just, just watch it. Just watch it. Look at the size of the guys. Look at the guys that are rushing the passer. Like That is not high-level Division I football players, but that's okay. It's year number one. He's got a runway. He's got some time. And if he improves to four wins from one win a year ago, that's already a pretty significant improvement. If he can somehow get to a bowl game, <laughs> people will act as though Deion Sanders is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and they probably should, given where Colorado was the last couple of years. Let's get to the other side of the coin. The guys that absolutely have to get in the win column this year as the head coach. I'm not saying hot seat. I don't like hot seat. I don't like to suggest that guys are you know, on the verge of getting fired, need to be fired, et cetera. I don't do hot seat conversation. We can have it a little bit, but I basically spin it as you better win. You better win this year or else the negativity is going to become palpable around your program. And right now in the era of social media, man, you do not want to feel as though you are trending down. You want to feel like you're trending up. One year down, you can survive that. You go two years down, three years down, it's going to be something difficult to overcome and to reverse what people think about you. We've seen it in the past. We've seen it in the past. Mike Norvell, for instance, at Florida State, he got things turned around last year, but it was not easy those first few years. So it can be done. It's just difficult to do. The team's that have to get it done this year for their coach. Let's start with Boston College. Jeff Halfley, things went pretty dang good in his first couple of years, both 2020, 2021. Things got off to a really good start. They were great with their recruiting. And then, boom, in 2022, they fell off the face of the earth down to three and nine. They had a lot of injuries. They had a lot of challenges. But Jeff Halfley has to have a winning season here in 2023. Let's go next to Jimbo Fisher. It shouldn't require a whole lot of conversation. I don't think he's in jeopardy of losing his job. A lot of people a lot of people seem to think that he is. I don't agree with that. I do think that Jimbo Fisher in order to continue the financial support that he's received from his boosters, he needs to have a winning season. If for whatever reason they fall flat again and they disappoint again, then we can't point to the youth, we can't point to the inexperience, we can't point to this, we can't point to that. We can only point to the head coach. And he needs to have a big year to break through. The good news is I think AM is on the verge of having a really nice season. Eli Drinkwitz at Missouri falls in a similar boat. He's 17 and 19 overall and does not have a winning year since taking over in 2020. Now, it was difficult, the situation that he stepped into. You walk in trying to change things during COVID, it's almost impossible. But you think about where the SEC is going. You bring in former rival Oklahoma. You bring in the Texas Longhorns. Missouri needs to win this year, and they need to get at least an upset or two. They almost had one last year against Georgia. Maybe they'll get one this year against Florida. They get them at their place in November. Whatever the circumstances are, he needs a big win to be able to lean on, and I think he needs to get back to a bowl game at the very least. Let's go to Neil Brown at West Virginia. Now, I think that's a really difficult spot to be in. He was expensive to get rid of last year. I think Neil Brown's a good coach. I really believe that. The JT Daniels experiment did not work. But I do believe that there is enough talent on that roster to be able to get things turned around a little bit. Now, to what extent? We're going to find out. But you look at the overall mark, just 22 and 25, 6-4 and four record there in 2020, and it just hasn't been as good the last couple of years. They had not posted back-to-back -back losing seasons since 1978 and 1979. Now there's a new athletic director in town and things seem to get back on track for Neil Brown if he wants to be there 
in 2024. And then finally, Dino Babers at Syracuse. Now, things went really well in the first half of the season last year before it all came to a screeching halt. I think this year needs to be an opportunity for him to continue forward. There have been some great moments in Dino Babers' tenure at Syracuse. It's a difficult job. Nobody's denying that. Can't dismiss the 10-3 and mark that they had back in 2018. You think about where they were last year going 7-6, and but the first half of the season, things looked very different than the last half of the season. Now, they played hard, and Babers definitely has a great feel for his team. I think he's got to get back to a bowl game this year at the very least if they're going to continue to move forward. And then finally, our superlatives for breakout quarterback. Now, like I said, quarterback competition is currently going on. So this list, if I'm going to be completely honest, totally incomplete. But... I'll leave you with this, just a couple minutes, just for you to digest, to chew on, to think about. Here's some breakout candidates at quarterback this year. Let's start with Dylan Gabriel. He's got to stay healthy at Oklahoma, but man, he's got a ton of talent. That offense is so different when he's on the field than when he isn't. If he can stay healthy, and if he can continue to get on the same page with Jeff Levy, I think he's poised for a massive year this year. Let's go to Jeff Sims at Nebraska, one of the more intriguing transfer prospects in the entire country. Comes over from Georgia Tech, where his talent was never in question. His supporting cast, maybe not so great. Maybe the fit within the offense, not so great as well. Either way, he gets a fresh start with Matt Rule, and I think he, given the fact that other quarterbacks have bolted from the situation, tells you all you need to know about what they've seen from him in practice. The reviews so far about Jeff Sims and what he's done there in Lincoln, everyone seems to be very impressed. Quinn Ewers at Texas, this one shouldn't require a whole lot of explanation. Year one for Quinn Ewers at Ohio State should have been his senior year of high school. Year two, he was the starting quarterback at Texas. It's basically the equivalent of starting as a true freshman. But guess what? The biggest leap you make as a player most of the time is between year one and year two. Well, year one to me for Quinn Ewers was last year because getting reps on the scout team, that's a difficult learning curve at Ohio State. You didn't really get to focus on you. You focused on throwing and catching and all these other things. But now it feels like Quinn Ewers has a different sense of urgency. He visited with Steve Sarkeesian. He referenced it himself just a couple of days ago. So I think Quinn Ewers is poised to have a massive year there in Austin, Texas. I think Jackson Dart at Ole Miss, assuming he can fend off Spencer Sanders, and by all accounts, that gap is considerable given the fact that Sanders was sidelined. Well, he wasn't sidelined, but he wasn't at 100% in the spring recovering from a shoulder injury. I think Jackson Dart is poised to complement that run game and to look really, really good this fall given the fact that he just beat out a very accomplished, very successful college quarterback that transferred to Ole Miss thinking he was going to win the starting job. Let's go next to Cam Ward at Washington State. Good year last year. I remember he was making that leap from Incarnate Word, made it all the way to Washington State, had a solid season, got to a bowl game, didn't go well for him in the bowl game, but the talent is there. Now it's about bringing on the processing, the accuracy, and all the other aspects of playing the position at a remarkably high level. And then finally, my final breakout candidate for now, we're going to adjust accordingly, is Tyler Van Dyke. Tyler Van Dyke at Miami. A lot of people saying, well, man, goodness gracious, last year he was supposed to be all world and fell flat. I think the offensive fit was less than ideal. Now that they're going to get back to doing what he's done in the past. Shannon Dawson comes over from Houston. This is going to be a pitch and catch type of offense. It's going to be a pushing the ball down the field type of offense. They're going to marry up the run game. Let's be honest. Josh Gaddis is a good coach, but it wasn't the right fit with Tyler Van Dyke. He's now at Maryland where it's a perfect fit with Talia Tungavailoa and what Mike Locksley is going to do. But it wasn't a great fit for what Miami needed to do with their quarterback. Now they're in a great system for their quarterback and a system that he's run before and run at a remarkably high level before. Rhett Lashley and Shannon Dawson. Rhett Lashley was the OC when Van Dyke had a terrific year. He's now the head coach at SMU. They brought in Gaddis. Well, Gaddis is now at Maryland. Now they bring in Shannon Dawson, who does a lot of things very similar to how Rhett did them at Miami and now does them at SMU. So those are our superlatives. Okay, watch list. Remember, this is a watch list. 
We will tinker with it and mess with it a little bit here in the next month and give you some hold me to them predictions when we get into August. As always, we so appreciate all your contributions to the mailbag. It means a lot to us that you guys listen and want to be a part of the show. So if you would like to hop in, look, there's a lot of mailbag questions that we're still getting to. But if you would like to hop in, submit your questions, always collegefootball at gmail.com. We'll get to them as soon as humanly possible. Jack, where are we going today, buddy? Going to Travis in Minnesota, who wants to take his wife to some of the best atmospheres in all all of college football. So what are the best places to tailgate in college football? And can you give me five games in 2023 where the tailgates will be incredible? (laughs) Well, I love the tailgate scene, right? And everyone always naturally goes to... Oh, you know, Ole Miss or uh, LSU or Clemson or whatever. Like to me, some of the coolest tailgates are the places that you've never really been to. Like one of the coolest tailgating experiences. Now we don't get to tailgate. Uh, I wish we could. Like there have been many times where I've been like walking past some tailgates. Like man, it'd be really fun to stop in for a dog or something before we head up to the booth. Whatever Mm -hmm. the circumstances are, we don't get to tailgate. But I think there are always some really good opportunities now. LSU Ole Miss is always going to be top 10. Like that, that doesn't matter what the circumstances are. That one's always going to be top 10. You get those two teams together, you get those two teams playing against each other. The, I mean, the fan bases are very different and yet very similar all at the same time. So that's got to be one that would be at or near the top of the list. I also think, even though it's not a traditional tailgate environment, Texas, Oklahoma is always a very unique scene. You're going to the state fair. You wear your crimson and cream or you wear your burnt orange. That one to me is always going to be unique. I also think this year, I want to go to Stillwater for Bedlam. Because if you think about, look, there's no love lost between the two programs already. But you throw in the fact that those two teams are going to tee it up for the final time. Perhaps they say it's the final time. I don't necessarily buy that, but... Look, I got to take their word for it. I think that one's going to be unique. Another one that I would think would be pretty special. Uh, I'm going to go to Milan Pushkar Stadium for the backyard brawl. You give me Pitt, you give me West Virginia in Morgantown. Good luck (laughs) because that's going to be a scene there on the 16th of September that will be as chaotic and as hectic and as much fun as pretty much any. Now, it might be pretty hostile. I'm not going to sit here and say it will, won't be. It's going to be pretty hostile. Uh, but I kind of like hostile when thinking about tailgating settings. And then one place that I always like to throw in that nobody ever really knows about, but I'll tell you this, man. Appalachian State is awesome. If you can get to Boone and just check it out. I've been in that stadium. I've seen it. I think that place is awesome. Now, unfortunately, I would have told you for North Carolina last year, that would have been the one that you would want to circle. This year's a little bit trickier to figure out. Maybe for the Coastal Carolina game, that's on October 10th. Maybe that's the one you want to go to. But either way, T Boone, or excuse me, T Boone, Boone, uh, North Carolina is awesome. So check those out. Those would be a few at the top of my list. But as you could tell, I'm kind of sick. You know, I'm kind of like, you know, why would I want to go to a place where there's probably going to be brawls? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, why do I want to go somewhere where there are people going to be throwing drinks at each other? I don't know, because I'm crazy. Like, why? why, why I, mean, I, don't know, I can't explain it. I'm not going to apologize for it. But I think I would go to the most hostile setting possible and try to play Peacemaker. Why not? I think that's what you should do. All right, Greg. Next question comes from Adam in Kentucky. I don't know if you saw, but Joe Milton threw the ball 70 plus yards at the Manning Passing Academy. So how much stock do you put into Joe Milton being able to throw the football 75 yards? Should we be talking about him more as one of college football's most dangerous quarterbacks and a Heisman candidate? First of all, his arm strength has nothing to do with how dangerous he is or what kind of candidacy he's going to have for the Heisman Trophy. Having a big arm is great. And here's what, let me just tell you. If you ever had to throw the ball more than 50 yards in the air in a game, then something's gone horribly wrong. Now, it helps if you can run around like Cordell Stewart and throw in Hail Mary. That'd be awesome. Doug Flutie, throw it 70 yards. Yeah, in a Hail Mary situation. Throwing at 75 yards is very, very valuable. But let's just hope that you're not in a Hail Mary situation, <laughs> right? How about just win and like don't don't worry about that. Let's not rely on a jump ball at the end of game as the regulation time is winding down. What I would say is, look, we know he's got a big arm. The problem is his arm has often been too strong. 
to the point where he's overthrowing wide receivers. So I want to see a governor on that arm. Like, I don't want to see him just airmailing it 20 yards over receivers' heads, which he's done in the past. I want to see him be accurate. I want to see him dial it back. I want to see him get the ball up and down. If he can do those things, I'll feel a lot better about what type of season he's going to have. Hey, thanks for being with us. So appreciate how many of you guys have come out, left a review, left a rating, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the ESPN College Football channel. It really helps us out. And we can't tell you how much we appreciate it. And we've read all of those reviews. Those of you that have taken the time to write just a couple of nice words, it really means a lot to us. Like we're here for you. We love the game. We love the sport. We do it for each other too because we love talking about college football with each other. But at the same time, man, we're here for y'all. And we and we love you and we appreciate you. And if you can continue to just take a couple seconds to leave a rating on whatever it is, the whatever the platform is, was the podcast platform or the ESPN YouTube page, whatever it is, leave a rating, leave a review and help us out because we don't have a budget for marketing. Uh, our budget basically <laughs> is, is stretched thin enough with us trying to put this thing together as often as we can. So we just want word of mouth to be the way we spread the word about Always College Football. And you guys telling your friends about it really helps us out an awful lot. So for all of us here at Always College Football, for Jack, for Peyton, for Mark, for Jake, I'm Greg. We hope you have a tremendous day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.